So we'll uh, make a start, and I think as the chair's prerogative, I'll ask the, the first question. Um, I did want to ask Dr. Mozaferian, if I could, uh, just about the two lines of evidence cited for uh, unprocessed red meat leading to diabetes. Um, with, with the uh, people who had uh, hemochromatosis eating a lot of heme iron progressing to the bronze diabetes, how generalizable is that to the general population? For example, in Australia, we're not allowed to give the Zoster vaccine to immunocompromised people, but it's recommended for uh, certain populations. Uh, secondly, in the, the other line of evidence, uh, the ladies with high ferritin levels uh, who during pregnancy got gestational diabetes. Uh, ferritin's a, uh, an acute phase reactant. And so I was wondering whether those people actually had inflammatory disease or indeed undiagnosed metabolic syndrome. Yeah, so uh, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, just as I don't know that cheese is causally uh, linked to low risk of diabetes, but I believe it's likely to be true based on the emerging observational data and mechanistic evidence. Similarly, I, I don't know for sure that unprocessed red meat raises risk of diabetes, but it seems plausible to me based on the mechanistic data and the preponderance of the evidence. So, you know, each of those lines of evidence, there are mechanistic studies, experimental in vitro studies showing that heme iron, you know, interferes with pancreatic beta cell function. The hemochromatosis is a genetic disorder. It's not a dietary issue. And as you said, gestational diabetes, you're right, ferritin um, could be raised for other reasons, but these are generally healthy, at least externally generally healthy women could be confounded. And then, you know, unprocessed red meats, as I said, are neutral for stroke, neutral for heart disease, neutral for cancer, uh, and, but linked to diabetes. So it's sort of funny that that jumps out along with the other evidence. So I think the evidence together is suggestive, um, but it's not conclusive. Thank you. We'll start with the first person on the, the left. Excellent speakers, and this is my third year attending these conferences. Um, I have a, oh, I'm Patrick Tickman, uh, Dr. Patrick Tickman from Las Vegas Internal Medicine. I have a question for Dr. Gland. For your long-term diabetics, or even those diabetics that just, you just have got diagnosed and they're taking medications, oral or insulin-wise, do you check their C-peptides to at least gauge if their pancreas will reawaken? Well, I recently started checking insulin levels, but it, it's definitely not necessary. You can just do your thing and, and see how it progresses. You know, start the diet and then uh, and, and just see how the patient responds. And that alone will tell you. Some patients respond immediately, some patients don't, and then it'll take longer. It's nice to have the insulin level, and then I calculate the home IR, and this gives me an idea of, of where we stand, and it, it's helpful, but you can definitely do without it. Do you shy away from SGLT2s for when you're starting a ketogenic diet? Oh, great question. Uh, SGLT2s, they're your friend and foe. It's, it's definitely a very helpful medication. Um, why? Because it works like the ketogenic diet. It decreases insulin levels, and it does. I, I call it the lazy man's uh, ketogenic diet, because it does everything you want. For, you get from the diet, but in comparison to the diet, you get 0.5 decrease in A1C versus the diet, which you know, as you saw, we have much bigger decrease, decreases. But I'll tell you that I've seen five or six cases of DKA. And if for anybody out there that doesn't know that uh, SGLT2s can cause what's called a euglycemic DKA, where you ha the sugar looks normal, but they're in, in, they have very high uh, ketones in the blood in it. And this is what we worry about when we think about ketoacidosis. It's not ketosis, it's ketoacidosis. And it's definitely an emergency. So I, I try to take them off of it. If I see a patient's going to be really compliant with the diet, I take off the SGLT2. Next uh, question on the right there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nadir Ali, uh, a fellow cardiologist from Houston, uh, uh, has a question to Dr. Muzaffarian. Uh, I applaud him for coming here and, and, and talking to a group like this. Uh, and uh, I'd like to give a big round of applause to him for doing that. <laughs> uh, brave man. 
but I, and I have a question, very short one. Uh, I disagree, less like Dr. Tobbs, with so many aspects about your talk. And as physicians, we are doing so many things wrong. We are giving statins for low-risk primary prevention. We treat diabetes with drugs that worsen insulin resistance. We give PPIs and make people sicker. And the change in our profession is not coming from top down, it's coming from bottom up. It's from people, citizen scientists. We no longer have monopoly over our knowledge. Any citizen scientist can have this knowledge by themselves. And physicians are changing because what they are learning from their patients. And unless the medical profession and people like you bring this change from top down, the medical profession I'm scared is going to get buggy whip for chronic diseases. So my question to you is that, how do you narrow that chasm? Well, so first, I mean, I guess I was never asked, but, but I don't, I fully agree that a low carb ketogenic diet will cause weight loss and metabolic improvement in a diabetic patient or an obese patient. It absolutely will work. The, the problems with it with the approach to the community that's keeping it from, from going mainstream is that, you know, the, is the several things. Um, first, it's the, you know, and it differs for different people, but first it's the belief that ketogenesis is absolutely necessary. I don't know that that's true. I don't think it's been documented, and I think it may be true. Ketogenesis may have some benefits, but more research is needed. Just going low carb without ketogenesis causes weight loss and improved diabetes. We know that. Second, I think there's this strange belief, as I mentioned, that processed meats are okay and processed oils are not from plants. So it's that, that's a strange, bizarre, kind of made-up idea that, that um, keeps it go, from going mainstream. Third, I think there's an extreme um, belief that it's only the ketogenic diet, sort of diet ranking envy that Gary highlighted, that no other diet can work. And I think that also is, is harmful to the cause. Um, the Mediterranean diet, which was number one on the list Gary showed, is probably the closest diet you can come to to a low-fat, uh, low-carb uh, ketogenic diet. It should be traditional Mediterranean diet, 50% fat, 15, 20% protein, 30% carbs that are slowly digested, you know, minimally processed. It's not a low-carb ketogenic diet, but it's not that far away. A high-fat diet, you know, f with with low starch and sugar. And so, you know, rather than the community saying, "Hey, the Mediterranean diet is great, but it's." better for people that are already healthy, and if you really want to lose weight, first let's get rid of all carbs and then reintroduce healthy foods like fruits and beans after a couple of years, and let's embrace healthy plant oils, and you know, let's eat plenty of dairy and fresh meats, but let's avoid processed meats because of this cancer risk. That's a very balanced view, and so it's somehow this, you know, there's, there's an extremism that I think hurts the cause, and so I think until the um, but, but there's overwhelming evidence that lower starch and sugar is incredibly beneficial for patients with obesity and diabetes. That's a truth that you guys have identified, that Atkins identified, that's incredibly powerful and needs to be popularized. And so if somehow that truth can be separated from some of these kind of um, cult-like you know, beliefs that really aren't founded in, in, in any evidence, but it's just personal beliefs, I think it'll be a, a real improvement. Dr. Reid. Uh, hi, my name is Georgia Eid. I'm a psychiatrist and a nutrition science writer. And this is my question for Dr. Mazavarian. Um, you mentioned that there's an association between red meat and type 2 diabetes. And you said that it was probably due to heme iron, an essential nutrient in red meat. So I'm curious, A, if that's the only reason that you're categorizing meat as less healthy than some other animal foods. And B, uh, then what would you say about the fact that things like duck and shellfish and chicken liver actually have more heme iron in them than red meat does. Thank you. Uh, so, so I actually don't, shellfish has more heme iron? That would be surprising to me Oyster, because heme iron makes things clam. red. So, yes, but that's oysters, clam, and mussels, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, some certain ones do, yeah, not, not all of them. So, you know, that hasn't been looked at. I mean, there haven't been large enough studies to look at those and if they're linked to, to risk of diabetes. Um, as I said, you know, there's, no other plausible nutrients that I see in, in unprocessed red meat that could increase risk of diabetes. So either it's a 
unique, confounded observation and why it's diabetes and not other things, I don't know. Or it is related to what seems mechanistically to be excess heme iron. One or two servings a week is, is probably just fine. You're not going to get up to those levels. But two servings per day, 14 servings a week, you're going to get pretty high levels of, of heme iron. So again, as I mentioned before, I think it's suggestive evidence. The mechanism's not clear. That's my own hypothesis. This is not the conventional wisdom, um, you know, the conventional wisdom that is meats are bad because of fat, right? So, so which I disagree with. It, it just and just to follow up, is that the only reason why is that hypothesis about heme iron the only reason why you view red meat as less healthy than other animal foods? Uh, well, it's linked to type two diabetes, as I said, and there's suggestive mechanistic mechanistic evidence. I can't think of any other reason why it would be, you know, any different than than chicken or other animal foods. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question on our right. Hello, I'm David Schwartz, and I guess I'm one of the citizen scientists that previous doctor talked about. And in addition to my 20-year history of GERD that I was able to put in remission and my addictions to carbs and my um, pre-diabetes, I was able to put into complete remission without medications a 40-year history of bipolar II disorder. So I'm wondering, the people that are conversant with the literature on the mental health effects of a keto diet, is what do you, to what do you attribute this to? Is it mediated by the microbiome? And how do you see uh, future avenues of exploration and treatment? I don't think I'm equipped to answer that. I don't know. I don't think I, anybody else want to comment? I, I find with my patients that achieving sugar or glycemic stability um, is enormously uh, beneficial for mood swings. So for example, uh, a glucose load causing a massive release of insulin followed by a glucose crash um, sending people to be hangry and then the cycle repeating six times a day uh, people tell me very often that their mood has stabilized because of the absence of sugar swings. Is there any connection with the uh, fecal microbiota transplantation effects that people are seeing with bipolar, unipolar depression, and schizophrenia? I, I don't know that evidence, but I, I will comment that, you know, um, the one of the big disadvantages of refined starch and sugar is it's all digested in the small intestine and you starve your bacteria. If you eat other types of foods, including you know, minimally processed um, high fiber carbs, but also other types of foods, you feed your bacteria. And so while the evidence is early, it's clear that sort of, it, you probably know this, but, but uh, others who, who, who may not know from germ-free mice and other experiments, about 25% of circulating um, factors in our bloodstream are from our microbiome, 25%. So a full quarter of what's, what our tissues are bathing in comes from my, our microbiome. And while it's not clear what's important from metabolomic studies and lipidomic studies and proteomic studies, when you have a healthy, well-fed microbiome, the, the profile of those factors is very, very different from the profile of a starving microbiome that's not getting any nutrition. So, so I think that um, it's, it's very plausible but you know, remains to be seen. It's very plausible that you know a healthy diet that feeds the microbiome is good for brain health. Can I just say this? I'm a carnivore. Eat red meat every day, and this helped my depression. And I will say that amino acids make things like serotonin, dopamine, all of those things. I know a lot of food allergies can cause your serotonin to be blocked, like histamines. I know this from personal experience in my family. If their histamines are high, it's blocking serotonin, and certain foods trigger that. I know for some extremes, you have to be aware of the spices you use on your foods. So that could be just one piece. Okay, great, thank you. Next question on the left. Hi, I'm Amber. My question is about bioactive compounds. Animal sourced foods are full of bioactive compounds. For example, carnitine, carnosine, choline, taurine, CoQ10, and glutathione. Uh, many of these have had good results therapeutically in physiological doses, but they're unquestionably essential. Plant 
bioactives are chemical defense toxins, and some of them have been shown to have medical promise when they're given in pharmacological doses, but none of them are essential. And so I'm wondering why you promote plant bioactives, which are more like drugs, but not animal bioactives, which are actually food. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, again, going back to Gary and evidence, there's been no randomized trials or prospective cohort studies um, or ecologic studies showing that eating those, um, you know, plant uh, meat bioactives is, is necessary once you get beyond a minimum amount to not be, you know, depleted. Um, choline, as you know, is linked to TMAO production and atherosclerosis. Whether that's causal or not, I don't know. I'm actually working with Stan Hazen on uh, a large R01 to look at TMAO and see if TMAO in prospective studies is linked to cardiovascular disease, but choline um, uh, uh, is, is actually potentially adverse. Um, you know, on the other hand, from, again, from, you know, a multitude of studies, including trials, um, you know, such as Predimed, um, when you eat more foods that, that have these bioactives, there's lower risk. Um, blood pressure is lowered by dark cocoa. That's been established in randomized controlled trials. Coffee is consistently linked to low risk of mortality and cardiovascular disease. I was pretty skeptical of the coffee findings because multiple short-term randomized trials had not seen any physiologic benefits of of coffee consumption, but there was a genetic Mendelian randomization study published within the last you know, year or two showing that if you look at genes linked to coffee, those genes are also linked to low risk of mortality, giving you know really pretty reasonable evidence that maybe that association is causal. So I think that that's my own personal hypothesis, that what brings up those foods together is the bioactives. Um, it's an emerging field. There's thousands of them. Um, you know, I don't think pharmacologic doses is the right way to go. Many of them are actually pro-inflammatory, as you said. They're they're um, irritants. They're they're toxins, and so it's it's a question of homeostasis. I think having low levels, natural naturally present in foods in the body, stimulates us the way exercise stimulates stress and improves insulin resistance through causing um, um, mild toxicity. So um, yeah, so I think that you know again there are essential compounds in meats, and it's okay to have one or two servings per week, but there's no evidence that high doses are, are needed for health. And, and I'll, I'll lastly, I should say that I think it was raised, I can't remember Gary or somebody afterward, that all of these, these cohort studies looking at both red meats and diabetes and processed meats and colorectal cancer and stroke, they're in typical populations. So um, is it possible that if you're on a low-carb ketogenic diet that you're protected from those adverse effects? It's totally possible. We don't, we don't know. It's totally possible. But, but that's, that's, but that's, what's that? The alleged adverse <laughs> The alleged adverse effects. Um, the alleged adverse effects, yes. Um, thank you, Gary. So um, it's possible, certainly. But, you know, again, in the absence of knowing that, why would you, why would you take the risk? So I think that, um, but it's very possible, and I think more research is needed. Yeah. Uh, I, I just encourage you to look at some of the research in uh, clinical trials, actually, with compounds like taurine, for example, which have been... Uh, there's a lot of evidence behind the benefit beyond perhaps this minimal dose. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker on the right. My name's Nancy Hempel. I'm a social worker working in post-secondary in Canada um, as a mental health counselor supporting students who are in crisis in a mental health way to stay in college and university. But my question is personal, and I hope enough people can relate to it. Um, I used the DEXA scan, so my, my question I think would be for Dr. Gallant. I used a DEXA scan to sort of chart my um, health as I was losing weight because I heard those scary stories about lo losing lean mass and bone density, and I really wanted to focus on health, so I was focusing on that visceral fat around my pancreas and my um, liver. And although all, everything else has been going really well with regards to not losing lean body mass and that kind of thing, there was just a slight increase in that visceral fat. And the DEXA scan people that I went to had this magic number of two pounds of visceral fat is the tipping point in which you start to have issues. And I've always managed to stay below the two pounds, but I, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about tracking that visceral fat fat using DEXA scans and whether it's hokey or whether there's something to it. 
I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I really don't follow DEXA scans. So I, I don't, uh, I don't, I, if you see everything going in the right direction, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, the study that I talked about that was following the fat was a very specialized yeah. way of looking at this with an MRI, and he had to use physicists that really helped with the programming. I think we're, it, it may not be specific enough, and, and, I, and I don't think, if, you, if everything is going in the right direction, you can, uh, maybe you know more. What are your macros? Are you doing bulletproof coffee, fat bombs, fat fast? Then um, that, if you're not hitting your protein goal and you're just dumping on the fat, you're going to lose muscle mass. But I don't. I haven't lost muscle mass, and I haven't lost, my bone density is great. That's great. I just, that they, on the DEXA scan, and I don't know if this is valid, they just showed fat on my liver and fat on my pancreas. And I don't think they can see. Yeah, it's and not, I think it's and not that a tool part, for that. Did it's you not, tell them you were eating keto? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that's why people go there that's, is to measure that. I don't know, go to somebody else. <laughs> I swear they're up for, they want us to fail. All right. I'm not kidding. When a doctor asks me, well, how are you eating? I say, none of your business. Let's move on. <laughs> I know where the nutrients are, and I'm not afraid to say that. And it's I, not in plant matter. And that is what, why I was hoping that, because exactly that's going on with my doctor, because now my cholesterol is high because I'm losing weight. Um, so I'm trying to get my own way of looking at it, and that's why I went to the DEX scan, hoping that that would give me confidence that everything's right, even though some things in traditional blood work might not look right. I want to make my peace with it kind of thing, and yeah. so that's why I was going to the DEX scan. But. Well, so I, I, when you say that things are going right, what, your triglycerides decreased, your HDL improved, everything, yes, everything was that, going in the right direction? Yes, all of that, except my cholesterol has went up, which I understand is a theme. Yes, <laughs> yes, we've got Dave for that. Yeah, <laughs> and so, and then I worried about, because I also stopped exercising, I stopped, um, in the sense of I stopped doing marathon runs and I stopped biking 100 miles a day, and that kind of thing, right? I was high, like, but I was very big when I, like, I had a lot of weight on me when I was doing that. And since I've gone keto, I don't exercise like that anymore. And I eat more and I'm losing a lot of weight, but it just seems like that can't really be true. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. So we'll move on to the next question on the left. Hi, uh, my name is Travis Statham. I'm a software developer from New York City and I uh, moderate the Keto Science and R0 Carb subreddits, and I'm also a moderator on World Carnivore Tribe, and I was also uh, visited Boulder uh, Carnivore Conference yesterday. It's really exciting. Uh, so my question is based around carnivory. Uh, I'm curious why the nutritional questions of, uh, that we're, we've been asking for the last 100 years haven't been asking what is the optimal diet that humans thrive on? And how do we prove that? And is there, uh, are we really just omnivores? Is it enough to say that we're facultative omnivores where we have to eat plants and meat in order to have the best health? Or is there something in our anatomy and our evolution that shows us that we are really carnivores that do best on a meat only diet? And is, I'm curious, is, should this be the null, the null hypothesis in nutrition that the RCTs need to debunk? Because I feel like all the evidence from the evolution side supports this idea. And we're coming along with these grain-based sugar uh, industrial grains and saying, oh, they're healthy. They're the new traditional, the new normal. Why don't we go back to the time when we evolved eating meat and hunting and say that needs to be where we start. Well, people like fast and easy. Nobody knows how to cook anymore, <laughs> which is kind of killing my business. But um, if you look at our cecums, this is where my question started years ago. Like, look at our cecums. They look just like a lion's. Right. They don't look like a koala bear. And this is why when people eat a lot of vegetables, they ferment, they cause gas and bloating, you know? How do you feel when you eat those? Just because it's at your fingertips and a commercial says that it's healthy. I was just talking to my kids and like, mom, 
they said that milk was healthy on TV. I'm like, you're going to get sold a bill of lies all the time on TV. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what our bodies look like, it looks much more like a lion's than it does any animal that's meant to eat plant matter. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Derry, I was curious if you had thought about this as a part of your, you know, like we, we went through the epidemiological and the mechanistic. Is this like the evolutionary side? Like why, why are we forgetting this part? Well, what I, what I found really interesting is, um, I don't watch a lot of TV, but on the History Channel, there's a show called Alone. And a man, it, they send people out with just a camera way out in the wilderness. Um, and one of the guys was a vegan his whole entire life. And he gave that up the day he got into the wilderness because he realized he could not survive looking for food all day. He needed to catch a fish and then get shelter built, well, opposite, shelter built and then catch fish. But he only, you had to prioritize time. We're living in a different society now. Yeah. I would much rather live in the woods and do something like that. But that's why I do bow hunt and fish. I fill up my freezer and I eat that as needed. I'm not gonna go forage for plants all day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I think evolutionary-wise, that's what we would do. I just found it interesting. He was a vegan his whole life, and he quickly gave that up to survive. Yeah. Uh, I guess all right. that's all. Next question. It's David Ludwig from Boston. Um, hi, Dari. I really... Uh, thank you. That's for Dari. I really liked your... Uh, effort to find common ground with your model of whole, slowly processed foods. And I think the key point you made there was that if you identify starch, refined grains, and sugar as the leading problem in the food supply, now that trans fats are mostly gone, you know, there's really broad consensus with uh, a what could be considered mainstream, traditional epidemiology and the low-carb community. So there's, given that, and I just want to say, given probably 75% agreement, I think there's 25% residual, which I would summarize with one question um, and a thought experiment. So are minimally processed grains functionally equivalent, which are up on your preferred foods, functionally equivalent to other of those preferred foods that are high in fat, such as olive oil, nuts, and avocado. In other words, is there any special benefit for the general population or for people with insulin resistance and diabetes to focus away from that? Is it okay to have fi are 500 calories of corn, of corn on the cob and brown rice and wheat, if not turned into flour, are they functionally equivalent metabolically especially in a population that has insulin resistance to these other healthful high-fat foods. Uh, so full disclosure, David and I are really good friends. So um, uh, and for about 15 we'll years. So after this, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, we've had many conversations. So no, I think I, I as usual, agree with and, and learn from everything you, you've said, David. Um, I think there is overwhelming agreement on the big principles. And as I tried to you know, mention, you know, in a previous question, there's, I think, some some reasons why the, the low-carb community is not gaining traction because they're not focusing on the agreements. Um, but I think that uh, I think that there is no human requirement for carbohydrate consumption. So, so absolutely, humans could thrive removing beans, removing whole grains um, from that list, and you could have a perfectly healthy diet, eating everything else on that list with with zero grains of any kind. Um, on the other hand, given you know, need for variety, given need for different costs, given the current food system, I think that those foods, the beans and the true minimally processed whole grains, are better than starch and sugar and other things. So in an optimal, perfect world, maybe you could eliminate them completely. I think they are a reasonable, um, you know, ground for somebody to get some reasonable health benefits, but probably not as good as fruits and nuts and fish and yogurt and some of the other foods. Next question on the left. Hi, I'm Jules Clancy. I'm a food blogger from Australia. My question's for Maria. Um, 
just really curious, you mentioned that you don't need fiber, and I'm just really curious, like, you don't worry, like, do you worry about your gut health, or My what? your gut health? Oh, I, I talked briefly about that, yeah. about the gut flora, and how collagen, like the tissues of meat fiber, yeah. it feeds the gut flora even better than what plant matter would do. So that's all it needs? Yeah. Wow. As long as you, you know, get enough of that, and it's going to need to be more than two or three times a week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if you get enough of that, that you will thrive. Right. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Gary, were you going to comment on that? or No. I can handle it. I'm a stuffed, you know, I can handle it. Next question on the right. My name is John Murray. I'm an attorney from Salt Lake. It's wonderful to see many of my heroes. Um, I married a graduate of the Tufts School of Nutrition, and she is a phenotype that is completely irresistant to insulin. She will never be, get overweight. I am one of six siblings who are the opposite. I am the thinnest. All the rest are 50 to 150 pounds heavier than I am. The question, it, it, going keto has been a, a, a time of cognitive dissonance, dissonance for the Tufts graduate, and now she's coming around, has come around, is embracing the keto, and it's been wonderful. Uh, having listened to the conspiracy, plant-based conspiracy theory this morning, I, I really have a question. I, I appreciate very much Dari being here because we have to bring a concerted j joint effort to change what's going on rather than to divide ourselves into groups that focus on things. Dr. Westman has, has done such a good job of saying we can find food in a cheap um, grocery store in Durham, North Carolina and, and be keto, and, and he, I believe. So I, it's more for Gary. Gary, do you see a strategy that will overcome the profit-based and the uh, the uh, cognitive dissonance that, that has to take place in the medical community and the people to be able to actually see the change that we're looking for in less than 50 years? And how do you see that? Uh, the, um, yeah, well, I think it's happening. So as people have demonstrated, I mean, it's, there's, there's always going to be the cognitive dissonance isn't going to go away. There's always going to be, there is something a little scary about all this as, Derry pointed out, it, it has a cult-like aspect to it. I mean, you're at a meeting with people who have had religious experiences, and um, we have to deal with that. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, when I started the Nutrition Science, co-founded the Nutrition Science Initiative, I thought we had an opportunity to approach this from a top-down level, and um, I'm just not that optimistic anymore that the, the we could really make a difference changing how the research community thinks about this. Um, I always think if we could find funding for better research trials, I think a great approach would be to get together with people like Derry and the Tufts School of Nutrition and actually design really rigorous nutrition trials, those that can be done. Like, for instance, the question David asked you, which you kind of ducked, was not, uh, not, not uh, no, no, it wasn't the, uh, the, the, uh, unrefined grains versus refined grains was unrefined grains versus nuts and other sources of in a anyway those studies can be done and we're but the world is moving anyway we are slowly winning this battle because people are getting healthier and every physician whose patients get healthier the patients spread the word the physicians spread the word so um, I don't actually see there being a conspiracy to, to keep this down other than cognitive dissonance and people having trouble believing um, that <laughs> this is more than some kind of fad. And unfortunately, to really understand that, you have to be somebody who's experienced these kind of conversions. So it's a kind of a tricky subject. I, I, I really, I, I'm optimistic. I don't think it'll take 50 years. I think it, it will probably take 20, but it's, things are changing so quickly. You know, this keto thing has caught on so quickly. It's such a fad right now. And what's fascinating is that 
It used to be nobody's supposed to do keto because it kills them. So even if you lost 60 pounds, it didn't matter. You had a, your doctor would talk you out of doing it. Now we've kind of gotten around that. Now people accept that it's healthy, so they see the kind of weight loss. And I think that's what spreads it. And it's hard to stop that because people really do want to be healthy. And they're willing to try different things to be healthy. And so, you know, I, I have some confidence. I did want to talk about this issue, the 75% versus 25%. So in every field, you need people who are pushing the envelope. But in this case, it's interesting. Most of us were kind of doing 75% and getting fatter and more diabetic, or at least many of us were. So until we sort of flipped into whatever this low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic, and I agree, I don't know if ketosis is necessary, or if it's just a marker that you're burning your own fat, but that's one of the things we have to get people to understand, that there, is, there does appear to be sort of a threshold effect, that it's not just about sort of any diet that you kind of restrict carbs a little bit, and restrict calories a little bit, that there really is, you know, a, a significant added benefit that comes from, you know, more or less rigid abstaining from all carbohydrates and, and getting fat. And so I think while agreeing on the 75% is good, it doesn't help the people who need to understand that to really have significant improvement, they may have to go much further. I I would just briefly comment that there are almost no Americans, zero, who are following the diet I recommended, and we published that in JAMA. So less than, less than a quarter percent of Americans are even meeting five of the, of the targets I set. So I think the idea that we were doing it and failing is just not true. I mean, people were eating horrible, horrible diets in this country, and we're nowhere close to no, no, what I was were. recommending. So, well, These are, this is an educated... Even educated. This is an educated, higher socioeconomic group. I mean, we were trying to eat healthy, very similar to the way we've been told to eat healthy. For the, and that's whether or not that's exactly how you would have us do it. Um, I, I think the way you were told 20 years ago, to, 15 years ago, to eat healthy is not correct. So, so I, I, you know. My, yeah. You're answering to my mother. Yeah. <laughs> so j just following up on uh, failure of outcomes, do, you, uh, do both of you feel that uh, our children will still be eating Cocoa Pops for breakfast in 20 years? I don't think our children are eating Cocoa Puffs now. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, it's, so it's, it's a collective way. I, I, think yeah. there's, I think we're winning the sugar battle. I think the sugar industry and the cereal industry and the beverage industry sees the writing on the wall and they know there's no going back. They're going to postpone the inevitable as long as they can. I mean, God knows what they'll be eating instead of Cocoa Puffs. I think we should worry th about that, you know, some kind of Franken food that's been created that in is paleo or keto and God knows what it does. But um, it's hard also for me to tell. You might have a better judge from where you are, but you know, we live in sort of rarefied environments where people are informed. Um, you know, what happens in Oakland and Berkeley, California is very different than what's happening in Mississippi. Um, so, you know, but I hope the Cocoa Puff phenomenon will die in 20 years. <laughs> Thank you. Next question on our left. My name is Dawn No. I'm a dietitian and certified diabetes educator from the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, we do use ketogenic meal plans uh, for people living with diabetes. So I had a question for Dr. Glant on um, metabolic flexibility. I've asked this of Dr. Hallberg, who will be speaking to us tomorrow. But once you, you know, not every person with diabetes wants to follow ketogenic forever. And I, I appreciate the conversation about um, does it have to be keto? And I'm just curious if you have a level of carbohydrate that's a, a potential maintenance level or um, what your experience has been in, in that post-ketosis phase, if you subscribe to that. Well, it, it's a difficult question. I have to admit that most patients that achieve, let's call it remission, uh, have to actually stay this way from my experience. I'm sorry to say. I, I see that, you know, when the lentils start popping back in and the little thing and the little bit of bread, so does the A1C go up. So I, I, 
I think that this has to be accepted as a way of life, and I say embrace it. Find what you like, F find a way of making it work, because your body cannot tolerate carbohydrates. That's the way it is. Thank you. Next question on our right. Hello, my name is Tim Noonan. I'm a family medicine doctor in Minnesota, and I grew up on an Iowa corn and soybean farm. <laughs> and so if anybody's biased to uh, think corn and soybean oil are healthy for you, it should be me, so I don't have to argue with my father at the dinner table. But my question is for Dr. Mazafarian, and you stated quite strongly that there is no evidence that you know, these oils could have any harm in the diet. And I just would like to posit that there's quite a lot of more basic science type of evidence that would suggest we might want to give pause to excessive intake of linoleic acid in the diet, increased levels of lipofusion in the brain as it relates to dementia, oxidized lipoproteins and how they relate to linoleic acid content, um, melanoma risk is increased and that's in multiple studies with increased risk of vegetable oils. And so with that being said, I just would like to say, the question is, of all the foods that you're recommending as healthy, they're all unprocessed, except the vegetable seed oils are highly processed. So it seems that you're making somewhat of a, there's some discord there in your recommendations that I don't know if you would like to speak to that or not. Olive oil is not highly processed. You stomp on olives, you get olive oil. Soybean oil and corn oil, canola oil, highly, highly processed. I also forgot to mention toxic aldehydes and their role in, the, in health and disease. So these are all things that I think need to be considered and have you considered them? Yeah. So, so I think that, um, uh, you know, the, the first thing is that uh, that the, the oils are linked to many health benefits, as I mentioned. Is it possible that there are other health harms to the processing methods? Absolutely. Is it possible that um, virgin oils would be better for you? Absolutely. But I think you, we shouldn't use the word processing as though it's negative by itself. You know, most human food has to be processed to be consumed. Cooking is processing. And so we really need to talk about optimal processing. Their foods need to be optimally processed to be, to be consumed. And we, I mentioned in my list that we don't actually really have a great set of, of under, rules and about how things should be processed. And just saying things should be unprocessed, I think, is not um, practical for the, for the great majority of, of the world. So, so I think that I don't have a rule that processing is bad. I think I have a rule that I want to follow the evidence. And um, could there be adverse harms of the way certain oils are processed? Absolutely. On net, on net do they seem beneficial or harmful? They seem beneficial. Uh, could they be more beneficial if they were less processed? Very plausibly. So, um, so I think that, that there's, um, there's definitely truths to the points that you raised, but, but that they're net harmful is uh, overall for health is, is not really supported by the evidence. Um, LA, you know, one of the big concerns about LA is that it leads, you know, potentially to arachidonic acid, which is sort of a prototypical pro-inflammatory factor. Multiple studies of arachidonic acid have now suggested higher levels are linked to lower risk of disease. Arachidonic acid is the natural precursor to some of the most powerful resolvers of inflammation, the SPMs that Charles Surhan has identified, resolvins, protectins, marisins. So I think the arachidonic acid is a complicated molecule. So again, I think there's potential truths to some harms of certain kinds of processing of oils. But net, if you look at the big killers in society, net, the, the oils are beneficial. And I do think, as I mentioned before, we should, we should hold industry responsible and ask the federal government for public dollars to do real studies to see if virgin oils are indeed better. Um, the Predimed interventional study, um, you know, most of the olive oil in the Predimed interventional study, the extra virgin olive oil replaced regular olive oil, 60% of it extra virgin olive oil replaced regular olive oil that's very common in Spain, and there was a significant benefit. So that also supports the notion that virgin oils are, are better. Thank you. It's uh, 6 o'clock. I wonder if uh, we just have one more question from either side. Uh, 
on the left. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, Richard Morris is my name, uh, from Australia. Flown a long way to be at a conference, and there's about uh, several dozen Australians all came to the conference. So to the, to, uh, I really want to mention, it's, it's kind of difficult not to feel that you've had a religious experience when you're a type 2 diabetic. You change your diet, and all of a sudden you're no longer a type 2 diabetic. And, you know... <laughs> thank you. And... It's, it was only last year in Zurich where the consensus opinion, the, there was two consensus opinion, opinions from the Food for Thought uh, uh, conference at Gary and, and uh, Dr. Mozaparin were both at. Um, the two consensus opinions, one was that saturated fat is not a nutrient of concern and the other was that diabetes is reversible. So this is something that's just only happened recently. So my, my question is really to Gary, uh, but, but anyone can feel free to, to chime in. Um, we've had... Um, uh, Dr. Mazafarian spoke about his public policy um, initiatives of, of, of trying to bring a quote unquote health, healthy diet to, um, to Americans. And, you know, uh, public policy is going to affect the army, it's the military, it's going to affect schools, it's going to affect a large amount of Americans. Um, this idea of healthy, what does it mean to a type 2 diabetic who ha is eating a diet that is considered unhealthy but remisses their diabetes? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the, the question is, 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 is in, you know, assuming, assuming that Dr. Mazafarian's... It's a clinical treatment that improves diabetes. It's not the same recommendation. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, yeah, from my perspective, when we give public health recommendations, we give population-wide guidance on how to eat, we're not thinking about people with type 2 diabetes. We're not even thinking about people with obesity. Again, that's this issue that, you know, we're thinking what, what's, what, what do healthy people eat? So we could tell everyone to eat like that. And, I, you know, there's no real evidence to me that it works as a form of therapeutic nutrition or corrective nutrition that will correct health. And I think that's one of the issues we have to wrestle with and public, even if we should somehow miraculously end up with the National Institute of Nutrition, it's one of the issues they'll have to recommend. And it's not just, you know, what might be the best diet for weight loss or what might be the best diet for type 2 diabetes, because the best diet is going to be the one that removes the cause of the weight gain and removes the cause of the type 2 diabetes. So you're going to end up with some significant issues in how we think about this. I mean, I don't really know what else to say that I, other than what I said at, at, at my talk on this. It's, um, that's when we get advice, when we're told how to eat, and I think, you know, I think when Dr. Mozafarian is telling us how to eat, he's not thinking in terms of a patient in front of him who he has to make healthy. He's thinking of a generic, and again, you please correct me, but a population-wide guidelines for how we can all be healthier. And we're thinking in terms of what we have to do to be healthy or what our patients have to do to be healthy, and that's a very different perspective. And when you find something that works, then, you know, again, it, it's, it's, and it's so at odds with the, the other definition of a healthy diet, then, you know, you end up with the kind of situation we have today. Well, the situation today is that a doctor will, will tell a, a patient who is you know, treating their diabetes successfully that their diet is unhealthy. And it's clearly not if they're, if it, if they're less diabetic on that diet than they would on, say, a Mediterranean diet, which is a bit of a Rorschach test. You know, a Mediterranean diet can be whatever you want it to be and has been, you know, so. You know, and I, I agree with you. I don't know what else to I'm sorry. say. <laughs> um, I have even, well... Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll go to our final question here on the right. Hi, my name is Misha Sakharov from Denmark. Um, I've, I just uh, want to thank um, Rod and Jeff for organizing the conference. It's amazing. So many different inspirations um, from the first conferences in Breckenridge to here. You can see a lot of people here. This is amazing. Um, I'm working um, as an integrative health engineer. We have a bead brain tumor intensive boot camps. We're working with people that have aggressive brain tumors, helping the families to um, stagnate, basically, the, the growth of tumors. And um, 
what I'm, I'm an engineer, so we used to connect the dots. And I'm wondering, you guys, you are, all are highly professional people that are um, uh, working with um, an area which is um, with uh, therapeutic or scientific approaches to nutrition. So you're specialists. But the, the diseases that you are working with, they are basically not diseases, they are syndromes. They are metabolic syndromes. Um, but it sounds like the most of you guys, you are only working with nutrition, but when we're looking at mitochondrial respiration, we have, uh, when we acquire energy, it comes from breathing, from oxygenation, and from uh, nutritional sources, micronutrients, macronutrients. So how can it be that we, when we look at the big picture of uh, metabolic syndrome and we know how, metabolic, um, uh, how mitochondrial respiration works, that we only look at one side and we cannot see the correlation between rates of, of oxygenation, of automatic breathing patterns, of, um, uh, for example, um, uh, rates of chronic stress, because what basically it does uh, um, we have inhibition of lipolysis by insulin. And cortisol and insulin, they are correlated in very different ways when we're talking um, um, acute stress and chronic stress. They can be, um, um, I mean, go in the same direction, go different directions. And in chronic stress, they basically go in the same direction. So when it, I can see in, in my clients that um, when we... Um, when we measure ketosis and everything is going good, but people cannot um, um, have better energy levels, so they stagnate, basically. So when we deal with uh, chronic stress levels, diminishing stress, we all of a sudden can see that their measurements and their perceived energy levels during the day and stability of their energy changes all of a sudden when we uh, work with chronic stress. So, Sorry, did can, you have a specific question? Yeah, and we can measure um, uh, heart rate variability and many different things. When will be time for a new study design? But I think that, that we all, our speech, like I, I study, I, I work on all different levels. I was told to talk about food today. I do talk about how to heal your mitochondria with cold therapy and light therapy and all these different ways. So we get that. Food was what we were told to talk about for 30 minutes, which is hard to do. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense, but... You're uh, saying that we don't talk about no, other no, no, mitochondrial I'm talking about issues? Studies. Ho, ho. I'm talking about studies. When will be time for a new study design that take consider... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have a metabolic uh, uh, syndrome, and the syndrome is multifactorial. Can we... When will be time for a new study design that basically... Uh, take this into account. Different ways of acquiring energy into the mitochondria. Thank you. Well, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah. I think so. All right. Thank you very much. Can you give a big thanks to all the speakers?